High above the Earth's surface, there's a fragile layer of gases. It's called the ozone layer. Acting as an invisible protective shield, it filters out almost all of the harmful ultraviolet rays of the sun. Recently, scientists discovered that something very unusual was happening up there. Something was threatening to destroy the delicate balance of the Earth's ozone layer. It's causing problems that are not just going to affect those of us who have produced them, but it's going to affect global societies worldwide. We've got to get moving. There's no time to lose. These issues should be at the top of the agenda of the politicians of the world. If we can't solve this problem, then we have no chance of solving the much more grave environmental crises, which are certainly going to come in the years to come. Can we protect the Earth's ozone layer? Are we on the right track? Join us now on an intriguing journey to discover answers to one of the most serious environmental dilemmas of our time. The year is 1928, and chemists at the Frigidaire division of General Motors begin searching for a safer cooling agent for refrigerators, an alternative to highly toxic or flammable chemicals like ammonia and sulfur dioxide. Two years later, a breakthrough discovery called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, it doesn't take long for both industry and the consuming public to embrace them as the wonder chemicals of the 20th century. Odorless, non-toxic, non-flammable, and extremely stable. At first, CFCs seem to be industry's answer to all its refrigerant and air conditioning needs. But in the years that follow, new discoveries help make CFCs vital to almost every economy in the world. Today, most of what we eat depends upon the use of CFC refrigerants at some point in the production and distribution food chain. And huge air conditioners with even greater capacity spur the construction of office complexes, hospitals, and shopping centers. It is essential to medicine for the preservation of blood and medical supplies. As a foaming agent, CFCs are used to make cushioning materials for things like furniture and automobiles. They account for a major portion of high energy efficient insulation used in new home and commercial construction, as well as in the walls of such things as refrigerators and freezers. Outside the United States, Canada, and several other countries, CFCs are often propellants in aerosol sprays. And most recently, CFCs played a critical role as a cleaning agent, providing high reliability in the electronics, aerospace, and telecommunications industries. Yet in the process of our economies becoming more and more dependent on CFCs, something happened. Something that was never anticipated by those early scientists who discovered the new wonder chemicals called chlorofluorocarbons. Between 15 and 25 miles above the surface of the Earth, there exists an invisible layer of gases called ozone. Formed naturally as the sun's radiation reacts with oxygen, this delicate shield is our only protection from deadly ultraviolet rays. Any serious breakdown or depletion of the ozone layer could cause health and environmental problems. In 1974, a paper was published which suggested that CFCs could cause a depletion of the ozone layer. Mario Molina co-authored the paper. It was actually late uh, 73 when I arrived at the University of California at Irvine and Cherry Rowland and myself decided to study this problem of what might be the, the eventual fate of these chlorofluorocarbons that we knew were being released to the environment, but 
we did not seek out an environmental issue. We were merely interested from an academic point of view. We were actually new to the atmospheric sciences field. We were just uh, laboratory chemists. It was a little frustrating at the beginning because nothing seemed to happen to these gases. They're very inert. But eventually, of course, the logical conclusion is that they would be destroyed in the upper stratosphere. Molina and Roland theorized that because of their stability, CFCs would not decompose in the lower atmosphere. And once reaching the stratosphere, they would react with ultraviolet sunlight to form chlorine, which in turn would begin to deplete the ozone layer in the stratosphere. It became clear that there is a potential environmental issue there. So I got uh, first worried, but I'm, actually my first reaction was that there should be some mistake. I didn't quite believe that uh, an industrial release of gases could have an impact on such a large natural system, a uh, global uh, impact. Robert Watson is director of NASA's program for upper atmospheric research. Yeah. After Roland Molina came up with a theory in 1974, it took a few years for the scientific community to try and analyze whether or not the, can, the theory they forwarded was correct. In the United States, the theory was taken quite seriously, and indeed there was a ban on the use of the aerosol propellants. However, the rest of the world did not follow the aggressive nature of the United States. I believe many people in the United States thought we had solved the problem. By banning CFCs as aerosol propellants, they thought the problem had gone away. From about 1978 through to 1985, several things happened. There was a series of scientific assessments and the predictions of how badly CFCs would destroy ozone varied over time. They rose to an all-time high where at one stage we thought that a given amount of CFCs would destroy 18 to 20 percent of the ozone layer. A National Academy of Science document came out in the early 1980s that suggested that that was significantly overblown. So I think everyone relaxed. Most of industry stopped doing work on alternatives. They didn't put the large amount of research money that was needed into technology for substitutes. So I think there was a, a sort of an ease and people say, hey, the ozone problem really isn't as bad as people thought. It was now more than a decade since the ozone depletion theory was announced. And still, industry, scientists, and government leaders looked for evidence that could establish a clear relationship between CFCs and future damage to the environment. The frozen wastelands of the Antarctic, where very little life exists. In 1985, the British Antarctic Survey Team shocks the scientific community by announcing the discovery of a seasonal thinning of the ozone layer over the South Pole. Richard Stolarski pioneered early studies of chlorine's effect on the ozone layer. His colleague, Mark Schoberl, has also done extensive research in the atmospheric sciences. Well, neither one of us had really looked at the satellite data very much before 1985, but uh, after this announcement was made, we, along with several other people here, uh, at Goddard went back and looked into some of this data. The advantage of the satellite is that it keeps flying over the pole. It's a polar orbiting satellite and you can map out what's going on over the entire Antarctic region. What they found was evidence of a seasonal thinning of the ozone layer. The outline in the center of the screen shows it to have been about the size of the United States. But it would still take scientists another two years of exhaustive research to discover what actually caused the phenomenon. There were several hypotheses. Which one do you react to? Um, you know, it, changing weather conditions, uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, changing solar cycle. What, uh, what hypothesis do you want us to react to? The following year, new teams of atmospheric scientists converge on the American research station at McMurdo Bay they eagerly await the return of the mysterious ozone hole. Their work is funded by both industry and government, who have sponsored and participated in CFC research since the early 1970s. Each team of scientists has its own theory, and for months they work around the clock, attempting to answer one basic question. Is the ozone depletion merely a recurring phenomenon of nature? or is it somehow linked to a man-made chemical? But as the 1986 Antarctic expedition draws to a close, it becomes clear that the scientists still can't determine what actually causes the ozone depletion. 
The community is not enormous, and the amount of funding is not enormous. So, you know, you have a small group of people working as hard as they can for a length of time, you just can't produce it overnight. You, you also, it's not like the Manhattan Project, you know. That, <laughs> it's also the point that uh, the, the gathering of evidence, the measurement techniques, uh, since their hypothesis, many of them had to be invented. And uh, many of the things had never been uh, thought about that much in the atmosphere. People had not measured them. They're very difficult things to figure out how to measure, and it takes very precise measurements, and it takes years sometimes to yeah. develop the techniques in the laboratory and then to apply them Up into in the field measurements the and to make them actually work. In 1987, an international team of over 150 scientists again tried to uncover the secrets of the Antarctic ozone depletion. As a DC-8 flying laboratory carefully studies the lower atmosphere in the area of ozone depletion, Scientists use ground-based instruments and launch balloon-borne payloads to sample air chemistry at McMurdo Station. And finally, NASA's high-flying ER-2 aircraft takes off from Puente Arenas, Chile on a dangerous 3,000-mile mission. A single pilot carrying a handful of sampling instruments flies directly into the Antarctic ozone hole. At 68,000 feet, the temperature outside is the coldest in which man has ever flown, 140 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Initial findings indicate a complex interplay between chlorine-containing gases from CFCs and meteorological conditions. The key to the puzzle are ice crystals in the upper atmosphere that convert the gases into byproducts that destroy ozone. Usually found only in the atmosphere of the South Pole, this explains why other parts of the world aren't dramatically affected by ozone depletion. But more importantly, this provides the missing link that everyone was looking for, strong evidence that CFCs are probably a major cause of the Antarctic ozone depletion. One of the gases which contributes to the greenhouse effect, chlorofluorocarbon, poses a deadly Chemicals effect. were banned today remnants of CFCs would still be depleting the ozone layer a hundred years from now. Candy Crowley for Antarctica CNN. Antarctica is a land of extremes, but nowhere are those extremes more harsh than here at the Media South Pole. attention is swift and dramatic as the world focuses its attention on the long-range effects of ozone depletion. We have very little... Robert Warrest manages EPA's stratospheric ozone research program. Yes, we know that the chlorofluorocarbons will deplete stratospheric ozone, but what is the effect here? How does it concern us? Uh, we can see that if more ultraviolet radiation does penetrate through to the surface of the Earth, it will definitely have an impact on the incidence of skin cancer, the non-melanoma skin cancer, possibly melanoma. But we don't know for sure whether it will have an impact significant impact on the terrestrial ecosystems and the marine ecosystems. There's strong evidence for it, but we just have not had enough research into those areas. The estimates that has been made by the Environmental Protection Agency is that if there's a 1% decrease in the concentration of the ozone layer, that is expected to lead to an increase in about between 3 and 6% in the incidence of the common skin cancers. I think it's safe to say that there has been no effect of ozone depletion on the incidence of skin cancer that we see today. If there has been any depletion of the ozone layer, it has occurred too recently to show up in the incidence of skin cancer. I really believe that within the next 10 to 15 years, today's societies have the last chance to make the kinds of changes that have to be made if we're going to have life support systems sustained on Earth 100 years from now. Things are changing very rapidly, population increase, economic growth. Uh, we're creating massive changes on a planetary scale, and in some sense with unknown consequences. The atmosphere on Earth has no boundaries and is global. Therefore, even if one country tries not to emit CFCs, as long as a neighboring country continues to emit it into the air, no improvements of atmospheric quality can really be made. Urgent action is necessary 
to prevent destruction of Though the world leaders were obviously concerned about the global implications of the ozone depletion, ongoing international negotiations aimed at reducing CFC consumption seemed at times to move very slowly. The only uncertainties are when and by how much. The type of protocol we agree will be a determinant in this equation. My recollection is that the Europeans at that time thought a capacity cap was all that was needed. The Russians had a scheme that was tied to GNP, and the Canadians had a scheme that was similar to that. And I guess there were a lot of positions put on the table and no consensus either on an approach or on what the end goal was. Uh, but the idea was how do we control and by how much uh, do, we, do we freeze and leave it there? Do we freeze production and consumption and cut uh, uh, consecutively until we reach a certain stage? Do we keep cutting the production and consumption until there's a complete phase out uh, of this? And that sort of issue was negotiated uh, for a period of one and a half years, more than one and a half years. The result, the Montreal Protocol, a landmark international agreement calling for a 50% global reduction of CFCs by the end of 1998. The negotiators believed these provisions were more than adequate to protect the ozone layer, and in fact, provided a margin of safety. However, because of new scientific evidence, the need for further CFC reductions became apparent. Virginia Bottomley is Great Britain's Minister of the Environment. The Montreal Protocol was pushing for a 50% reduction in CFCs by the end of the century. In Britain, we hope to achieve that by next year. And we're now absolutely convinced by the science that we must push for an 85% reduction. The Montreal Protocol is, of course, uh, very important. Uh, in its uh, present form, it doesn't go far enough. And uh, most uh, people in the scientific community and uh, the even uh, people in industry, I believe, would agree that more needs to be done. And indeed, that's, I believe, what is happening. Joseph Glass is director of DuPont's Freon Products Division. He recalls DuPont's decision to phase out all CFC production by the year 2000. In early March, the uh, NASA Ozone Trends Panel, a group of uh, some 100 scientists or so, who had been chartered to review the state of the knowledge of science about ozone depletion, gave their report. Uh, that report included not only what, what had been learned uh, in the Antarctica, but included a, a very comprehensive review of, of all of the measurements that had been taken for uh, well over a decade on uh, actual ozone depletion as measured through uh, satellite instruments and ground-based instruments. We, DuPont, immediately recognized that the science had indeed changed, and so we communicated a new policy, virtual total phase-out uh, of CFCs. The urgency will be redoubled by this year's increasingly clear evidence that CFCs are implicated in global ozone depletion, as well as being part of... As world leaders, scientists, and industry began working towards a more aggressive phase-down of CFCs, the ozone depletion issue entered its most crucial period. Industry's response was clear and strong. Whether you're from industry or the scientific community or government, um, we all must accept the reality that this is a global challenge. Regarding the alternatives, in earlier days, we worked hard in how we could have customers use more Freon. This past year or two, we haven't done any of that sort of work. We now work only on alternatives. All the producers of CFC are working together to conduct toxicology and environment impact analysis on the new substitute. We've been working with users, providing them samples so that they can start working on how to change their systems so as to make it effective when the new products become available. We feel obligated as a major chemical company to make sure that the communication of the magnitude and the importance of this problem is uh, very closely coordinated uh, and communicated to our customers. Developing alternatives to CFCs, it's not an easy task. DuPont is the world's largest producer of CFCs. Their scientists are well aware of the challenge. Leo Menzer is a research manager. And the chemistry is much, much more complex than it is for the existing CFC compounds. The new materials are less stable. That's why they're attractive as replacements. They decompose in the lower atmosphere. First of all, you have to look at the, the physical properties of the compound that you're trying to replace. And that reduces the scope of the problem from potentially many hundreds of compounds that might be available 
to, to maybe only a dozen or so when you consider toxicity, flammability, and, and process conditions, and so on. And we're now looking at introducing these, these uh, new alternatives over a period of three to five years beyond 1990. So it's a very, very rapid, aggressive program. Half a world away, CFCs are essential to Japan. They have a thriving economy that depends upon the manufacture of sophisticated electronic components. About 100 miles outside of Tokyo, at an industry research and development center, chemists are working around the clock. They are analyzing potential CFC alternatives used as cleaning agents in the electronics industry. At Ford Motors Electronics Division in Detroit, the CFC issue is a major priority. None of the alternatives that are uh, on the horizon are what we would call drop-in alternatives. So there, there's no chemicals out there now that we could just drop into our existing machines and get the same kind of uh, performance out of them. Our biggest concern right now is that all the chemicals that uh, have been mentioned as possible substitutes for CFC-113 have other impacts on the environment. And we don't want to trade one environmental problem for another. We don't want to trade uh, damage to the ozone layer for possible uh, damage to uh, water or air at the ground level. Igloo Products is the largest supplier of refrigerants used to recharge automobile air conditioners. There essentially would be no automotive air conditioning uh, until uh, a substitute uh, and new systems are developed. Major bulk manufacturers of uh, CFCs, uh, they are working to develop substitutes uh, that would take the place of CFC-12. Hopefully, they'll, they'll be coming up with substitutes within three or four years. Carrier Corporation is a leading producer of air conditioning equipment, including huge units for skyscrapers and apartment complexes. Existing facilities have large equipment that have been built sometimes into the basement of the buildings. The buildings are practically built around them. They have a life of 25 to 30 years. There is no drop-in refrigerant available for them, nothing that can be just put in and replaced with the existing refrigerant at this time. You can't just take down a building and put in a new piece of equipment. So we're working very closely with some of the producers to evaluate the alternative refrigerants, or I should say substitute refrigerants, in existing equipment to see what the effect is on existing equipment. What kinds of changes would have to be made, assuming those substitutes are approved? But there also has been some significant progress. At a Bosch Siemens plant just outside Stuttgart, West Germany, they turn out over one million refrigerators and freezers each year. Today, new manufacturing methods have reduced by 50% the amount of CFCs used in the making of polyurethane foam insulation for their products. In the refrigerant uh, area, we have, we have compounds available today which will serve the marketplace uh, once the transition of the equipment manufacturers is complete. In the blowing agents arena, uh, some customers have already found alternatives and, and have gone commercial uh, with them. The uh, polystyrene food packaging, uh, those kind of products are able to use an alternative now and uh, a major manufacturer of foam uh, products in the insulation applications announced just this week that by the end of next year, they will convert away from uh, CFCs to alternative uh, uh, fluorocarbons in this case. So my confidence level is, uh, is very high that we will be able to work out uh, these changes for the marketplace through a reasonable transition period. To ban chlorofluorocarbons without a substitute is to change the society that we know and to take away from people very important and essential effects that we have grown to depend on. The chlorofluorocarbons are not uh, produced just for the sake of production. They are the base of a certain number of industrial activities, particularly uh, freezing and refrigeration and as solvents in microelectronics. And, and these are colossal industries from the economic point of view as backbone for the economics of a number of countries. Though much research remains to be done, the introduction of CFC alternatives promises to be a reality within a few short years.
In addition, the Montreal Protocol has become a model for dealing with future environmental issues. The Montreal Protocol is clearly a landmark document insofar as it is the first time there have been a truly global convention and a protocol to a global convention that is trying to safeguard the environment. I think it bodes well for some of the other issues that we have to deal with in the future. For example, climate change is clearly an issue of today. It will clearly be the issue that faces both scientists, policy makers and big business for the next couple of decades. It ought to help us in dealing with the greenhouse issue, which is much more complicated and much more difficult, requires participation by even more countries. So the more we start understanding that yes, we are a global society of individual nations, but really we are citizens of the world, and that as we go about dealing with global economies, we have to also deal with the global environmental problems that those economies produce because we only live in one world. Protecting the ozone layer, a search for solutions, has been brought to you as a public service by the DuPont Company.